quite a happy experience for we physicists connect to geometers and mathematicians and I'm hoping we're going to have a very fruitful week ahead of us. Uh, not much more to say except that, as some of you may know, we will have a, a distinguished lecture series going on through this week. So our, that's Monday, uh, Wednesday, Friday, by our, uh, the lecturer Faye Docker. And uh, today after that lecture, we will have a reception in the reception area outside. Uh, so I stick around if you want to get together. Uh, and without any delay, I give it to Robert to chair the first session. So I think we announced the time of the first talk for 10 past nine. Um, and so I think that maybe it's good that we take that time because I imagine a lot of people are still gonna join online. And uh, so let's have a little break before we start the first session. <laughs> but anyhow, it's been a pleasure putting this conference together. I hope that we have a very productive week. And I'd like to introduce you to the first speaker of the morning who is Michalis de Fermos of Princeton University and Cam University of Cambridge. And he's going to tell us about the cosmic censorship conjectures in general relativity. So thank you very much to the organizers. Uh, sorry that uh, can't be there in, in person. It looks like a very, very nice workshop. Uh, so my uh, title is the cosmic censorship conjectures in general relativity. And I'll try to give uh, an overview of, of these conjectures, their formulation, and recent work that's been done uh, towards their solution. So um, maybe I'll go immediately and tell you the plan of the, of the lecture. So first I'll review the formulation of the cosmic censorship conjectures. Um, and uh, as many of you know, there's, there's something called the weak cosmic censorship conjecture and there's the strong cosmic censorship conjecture. And somehow the, the weak cosmic censorship conjecture is related to naked singularities and to the question of stability of black holes. So the, the first topic I'll, I'll, I'll talk about is what I'll call the outside story, which is precisely that. Uh, the strong cosmic censorship in some sense is, is, is primarily concerned about possible null boundaries of space-time and, and sort of what goes on inside black holes. Um, so that will be the, the, the inside story. And uh, time permitting, but I, I suspect it it won't be, but in any case, if, if there are questions, I can certainly answer them. Uh, I'll end with a discussion of what happens to the strong cosmic censorship conjecture when you add a cosmological constant to the action equations. Okay, so this is the plan of the lecture. So off we go then, let, let me begin with a review of the cosmic censorship conjectures. So uh, so the modern uh, point of view on, on cosmic censorship is the so-called evolutionary formulation of these conjectures. That's to say these, uh, the formulation of these conjectures that uses the, the language of the maximal Cauchy development. So uh, a canonical reference for this um, sort of modern formulations is this very, very nice survey article of uh, Dimitri Sistozulu from uh, more than 20 years ago now. Uh, on the global initial value problem and the issue of singularities. But in some sense, this uh, evolutionary formulation of the conjectures goes back to uh, Bob Geroch and, and, and Horowitz. Um, and this shouldn't be so surprising because of course, uh, Geroch and um, Yvonne Choquebra were the, the people who introduced the notion of maximum Cauchy development, which is so fundamental to discussing any issue in general relativity. Okay, so what are what are the uh, formulations? So there's the so-called weak cosmic censorship uh, conjecture, and I should say that in their original formulations with slightly different language, these both cosmic censorship conjectures go back to Roger Penrose. So, uh, so the modern formulation of weak cosmic censorship is simply the following: for generic asymptotically flat initial data, for let's say the Einstein vacuum equations, or more generally Einstein Mather equations for reasonable Mather then the maximal Cauchy evolution should possess a complete future null infinity. So in discussing the cosmic censorship conjectures, it's always good to have in mind these three uh, Penrose diagrams um, uh, sort of uh, for comparison. So this is, of course, the, the Penrose diagram of, of Schwarzschild, thought of as a maximal Cauchy evolution of initial data. This is the um, Penrose diagram of Kerr, thought of as the maximal Cauchy evolution of again, two-ended asymptotically flat initial data. Um, and finally, this is uh, the sort of Penrose uh, diagram here of a, a putative um, sort of uh, naked singularity space time. 
okay? Arising again from maybe one-ended, asymptotically flat, complete initial doubt. Okay, so, so um, how do these spacetimes stand with respect to the, the sort of predicate of, of, of this statement? Well, uh, the point is that the, um, let me maybe choose a, a more a nicer color. I don't know. Okay, ah, maybe this is bigger, yeah. So this is future null infinity in these uh, Penrose uh, depictions. And, and in both these cases, future null infinity is complete. Okay, so both these sort of space times satisfy this, this predicate. Um, whereas uh, what you're to think is that in this, in this picture here, future null infinity ends in finite affine time. So the affine length in some sense of, of future null infinity is, is, is finite, so far away gravitational radiation observers, they can only observe for finite time. And then, well, because they receive information from a singularity, the maximal Cauchy development ends. Okay, so uh, what we cosmic censorship is trying to tell us is that this cannot occur generically. Now, I, I, I should make a little comment. Uh, the colloquial sort of uh, description of weak cosmic censorship uh, is the statement that generically singularities are cloaked by horizons, okay? And you'll see here that in both of these examples, right, this is the singularity in some sense, and well, okay, we'll get back to what's going on here, but in any case, um, whatever is going wrong in these examples is certainly cloaked uh, behind a, a, a horizon, right? This is a horizon, this is a horizon, and everything that's going wrong is 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 safely behind that. Uh, but that's you know in the statement that I made, I haven't sort of even mentioned horizons. I've made the statement just in terms of infinity. So uh, so the the attractiveness of this statement is it's sort of the weakest formulation that you can possibly give, which captures the main point of this conjecture, which is that uh, whatever bad things happen, faraway observers can can indeed observe forever, and the theory is predictive for faraway observers. Um, but you might, um, uh, if you want, add statements of the type that any singular behavior is in some sense behind a, a horizon. You might even throw in for good measure that these horizons are future complete in some sense. Okay? So you can certainly add such statements and maybe I'll, I'll give some comments later on. But if you want, you, you can capture the, the, um, the spirit of this conjecture without ever mentioning uh, properties of horizons per se. Okay. So that's weak uh, cosmic censorship. Um, what about strong cosmic censorship? So uh, maybe I should preface this all that actually these uh, epithets are quite unfortunate because uh, strong cosmic censorship is not actually a stronger conjecture than weak cosmic censorship, but these names are, are traditional. There's a reason for this terminology, but let me not try to go into great lengths. Uh, as traditional names, they've stuck. So. Uh, always keep in mind, though, that this really is a, is a different kind of statement. And we'll see this immediately. So what's the conjecture? Um, so conjectures for generic asymptotically flat initial data, the maximal Cauchy evolution is inextendable as a suitably regular Lorentzian manifold. So, um, so again, we look, at, we look at Schwarzschild here. Um, so Schwarzschild is actually uh, perfectly fine, uh, um, um, sort of um, from, from this point of view. Any in 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 any sense that you want to um, um, define the notion of of inextendibility. So maybe I should I should say this um, uh, sort of already that uh, in order to make this conjecture precise, uh, you have to say what you mean by uh, suitably regular. Okay, and in fact uh, we can we can distinguish between. Uh, three formulations of this conjecture, um, depending on what type of suitable regularity we impose on the inextendability. Okay, so let me, let me, let me try to explain this again from the perspective of, of these examples. So, so Schwarzschild is sort of the, the paradise from the point of view of the uh, predicate of this conjecture. And the reason is the following, that, that actually the Schwarzschild uh, manifold is inextendable in the strongest possible sense you could imagine talking about inextendability for Lorentzian metrics, namely it's, it's inextendable as a continuous Lorentzian metric. Yeah. And what this corresponds to sort of physically is the following, 
there are two kinds of observers in Schwarzschild. There are the observers like this one here that, that live forever. And there are the observers that fall into the black hole that live for only finite time. And these observers, of course, encounter a, a, a curvature singularity. That's something that we all learn in, in the books, but actually something much worse happens to these observers. Namely, uh, they're actually torn apart by um, infinite tidal deformations. And there's a way to capture that in terms of properties of just the metric, which is, I think, very close to one of the themes of this workshop. And that is that the, the, the metric is inextendable, not just as a C2 metric, but as a, as a C0. Okay. And this is sort of a very attractive property because it sort of gives classical general relativity if sort of the theory in general was like the Schwarzschild solution, then in some sense, classical general relativity has a very attractive closure property. That's to say, uh, it really predicts everything about classical observers in the following sense. Uh, observers either live forever or they, they are actually destroyed as classical observers. So well, whatever happens to them later is not in the domain of classical physics. They have been destroyed as classical. Observers. So this is sort of one of the reasons why um, this picture is, is, is so attractive. And, and this sort of C0 formulation of um, strong cosmic censorship is, is, is such an attractive uh, formulation. Okay, so by the way, the, the inextendability of, of Schwarzschild as a C0 Lorentzian metric is a relatively recent result due to Jans Beers. Okay, so, so that's sort of Schwarzschild. Um, so the, the sort of bad situation for the predicate of this uh, conjecture is exemplified by uh, the Kerr solution. And in fact, the, the, the Kerr solution violates this predicate no matter how you want to um, sort of uh, define suitably regular, because this is the situation where the, the maximal Cauchy development, so the maximal Cauchy development here is this region of space-time. So this is extendable beyond this hypersurface as a smooth uh, Lorentzian metric. In fact, there's a solution of, of the equations. And well, why, why is this a boundary of the maximal Cauchy development? It's a boundary because these extensions fail to be um, globally hyperbolic. Okay. So, um, so somehow this, this is a, a counterexample to, 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 to this predicate, uh, no matter how you uh, would sort of try to um, formula should be regular. And this is very problematic exactly because um, what, what this corresponds to is a failure of predictability. Here is a, an observer, nothing whatsoever bad happens to the observer. The observer crosses the Cauchy horizon. Uh, observer has not done any local measurements that would indicate that they have left the domain of classical physics yet initial data no longer is sufficient to, to say what, what, what happens to this observer because of this failure of global hyperbolicity, they are, they are now receiving information. Okay. So if you want strong cosmic censorship, the most spectacular way that this, this um, uh, sort of predicate can fail is, is exemplified by, by, um, um, uh, by the sort of curse situation. Okay, um, and uh, finally, uh, it's, it's worth revisiting sort of this uh, uh, situation here. So I described this, as a counterexample to the uh, sort of um, statement of weak cosmic censorship if we did not impose genericity um, on the basis of, uh, so if, if, if this boundary at infinity has finite length in some geometric sense, then this, this would violate the, the predicate of, of weak cosmic censorship. Um, similarly, if, if, if this boundary here is regular, so you can imagine that this boundary here is actually C infinity, then like in the Kerr case, you, can, you could extend the space-time beyond like this. These extensions would not be globally hyperbolic exactly because of, of you know, you'd have to receive information from this point, which is not the space. So, so this again, you should think of is, is a, a violation of strong cosmic censorship unless this boundary happens to be single. Okay. All right. So, so Strong cosmic censorship sort of um, uh, is really the statement that these two cases do not happen generically. Okay, so I, I I talked about the 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 C zero formulation and I tried to motivate it because it, it gives a very attractive let's say epistemological closure 
to classical general relativity. Um, there's also sort of a much more naive statement, the sort of what I, I would call the C2 formulation, namely that uh, generically maximal Cauchy development is inextensible as a C2 Lorentzian manifold. Uh, so of course, C2 is where curvature lives. This is typically a much easier formulation to prove because you can, you, you can identify C2 inextensibility often, not always, by some sort of curvature blow up. Um, uh, so of course that corresponds to failure of solutions of the Einstein equation to be classical in the sort of strict sense of that word. And then from the PDE point of view, this is actually a sort of not a very well motivated um, sort of notion because the PDE theory of the Einstein equations doesn't really see the C2 class. That's not a class where you have well posed and so on. So, um, so a middle ground uh, is a sort of the so-called H1 formulation, which maybe I'll talk about later on. So this is the statement that um, uh, sort of generically the maximal Cauchy evolution is inextensible uh, as a locally H1 um, uh, Lorentzian metric. And you should think this corresponds to, to sort of weak solutions of the Einstein equation. So that, that formulation really says that sort of you cannot extend even as a, a weak solution. Um, of the Einstein equation. So I'll, 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 I'll get back to this because, well, we'll see, we'll, 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 sort of, we'll have to consider this uh, formulation in, in view of the results that I'll describe. Okay, so this is the strong cosmic central conjecture. And finally, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of put up a, yet another uh, conjecture, even though as you'll see later, uh, I'm putting it up as straw man's uh, conjecture. Um, namely what I'll call the, the space-like singularity conjecture. One of the reasons is that often strong cosmic censorship is confused with this conjecture. So I'll prefer to think of these as two completely separate uh, uh, conjectures. So, uh, so what is this space-like singularity conjecture? This is the statement that for generic asymptotically flat initial data, the finite boundary of the maximal Cauchy development is space-like. So basically this is saying that um, if there is a finite boundary to this maximal Cauchy development, I mean a boundary that's not quote ad infinity, then that should be space-like in some suitable sets. And again, you should think that um, the, the Schwarzschild case satisfies this because here we see that this, this is what we think of as the finite boundary of space-time and it's space-like, whatever that means. Um, whereas uh, the uh, Kerr case, the finite boundary of, of, of the maximal Cauchy development is, is null, so this um, does not satisfy this conjecture. And similarly here, the, the, the finite boundary in the case of, a, sort of this naive picture of a naked singularity, um, uh, the finite boundary is again null. So this again would not satisfy this statement. So if you want this conjecture to be true, uh, you better show that, that, that these are non-generic. Okay, so it's not, not so easy to make this conjecture precise because you sort of, you have to distinguish somehow the, the finite boundary from the boundary at infinity. Now, there are many notions that have been proposed of boundary of space-time in, in general relativity. And I think, I think there are many people in, in this audience who know a lot more uh, Lorentzian geometry than, than I do, but it would be very nice to have a sort of uh, definitive uh, statement of this conjecture, uh, even though, as you'll see, I, I, I think of it as a strong conjecture. Okay, so, um, so these are the, uh, if you want, the uh, cosmic censorship conjectures. So now let me try to tell you uh, their status in general relativity, uh, beginning with what I'll call the, the, the outside story, which is really the, the story of, of, of black holes and naked singularities. Okay, And this is connected to weak cosmic censorship. So, um, so weak cosmic censorship, what, what is actually known? Well, really the only setting where we have a definitive understanding and definitive intuition uh, is a very restricted setting. Um, and uh, specifically, it's sort of uh, the results of Christodoulou on the Einstein scalar field system in spherical symmetry. So maybe I should preface this all by following comment. Uh, so, uh, so of course, uh, these conjectures are about generic solutions of the Einstein equations, maybe in vacuum or with mother, uh, but without any symmetry. So uh, anytime we talk about you know these statements in symmetry, well, of course, symmetric solutions are manifestly non-generic. So anytime we talk about proving these conjectures sort of restricted to symmetry, we mean that we only consider symmetric solutions and we look for genericity in the class of symmetric solutions. So, um, so in, the, in, in the 90s, 
uh, Dimitris Christodoulou basically solved that problem for the Einstein scalar field system under spherical symmetry. Um, so this is the, the sort of the final paper and his theorem uh, is the following. Uh, so for uh, generic uh, asymptotically flat one-ended initial data for, for this Einstein uh, scalar field system under spherical symmetry, the, the Penrose diagram either looks like Minkowski space or looks like this. Okay, so it looks like this. So this is this iconic Penrose diagram, which was also, if you if you noticed on the title page of, of, of my slide, and in particular, all three of the above conjectures are true. That's to say, future null infinity is complete. Uh, and if you want to say it too, then you know, any singularity behavior is, is hidden behind this, this horizon, which is also uh, future complete, I should, I should uh, add. Um, so that's weak cosmic censorship. Um, but also this, this is inextendable, at least in a suitable sense. Let me not say the, the details. So strong cosmic censorship is also true. And finally, the, the, the singular boundary is, is, is in fact space-like. So the, the space-like um, singularity conjectures. So all three of the above conjectures are true, reduced to spherical symmetry in the sense that I, I said. However, uh, he also showed that the genericity assumption is however necessary. Okay. In particular, he showed that there, there, there exist uh, sort of initial data such that the Penrose diagram of their Cauchy development looks like what I've just uh, drawn here. Um, so this is a, a Cauchy horizon uh, coming from a, a point here that we can identify as a naked singularity and future null infinity is incomplete. Okay, so this is actually a, a, a counterexample, not, not just to weak cosmic censorship, but, but to strong cosmic censorship if, okay, if it were it generic, okay? But remember, uh, he showed that generically you, you have this. Okay, so this is really um, the only general setting in which we have a complete understanding of, of the cosmic censorship. Okay, um, so, Let's go beyond uh, spherical symmetry and the Einstein scalar field model. Um, we do actually have a, a very important recent result uh, on the Einstein vacuum equations without any symmetry, which uh, if you want, generalizes the, the, the second of the results that I just told you, namely there again, there do exist, hopefully non-generic, naked singularity, uh, vacuum spacetimes arising from regular asymptotically flat initial data. So this is a theorem uh, which appeared in several papers of, of Rodniansky, schlappetoch rothman and, and, and schlappetoch rothman um, So uh, basically what they showed is that there exist naked singularity vacuum solutions uh, which, which have this, this, this Penrose type. Now this is a much harder theorem than the, the theorem uh, of, of Christodoulou constructing naked singularities for this uh, Einstein scalar field system under symmetry, precisely because in, in the vacuum case, you can't really impose any non-trivial symmetry that helps you in this problem. Uh, as we all know, the vacuum uh, equations do not admit, say, non-trivial spherical symmetric solutions. So, um, so dynamically spherical symmetric solutions. So, uh, so whereas this, this beautiful theorem of, of Christodoulou is really a theorem about ODEs, this theorem about the existence of such, uh, as, as such naked singularity spacetimes, uh, this is uh, very much a theorem about PDEs and, and, and it's, it's quite intricate to prove. Okay. So, so there do exist naked singularity spacetimes. Uh, so our only hope is to show that indeed they're, they're non-generic as opposed to uh, that, they, that they never occur. So, um, so where are we? in showing that uh, such solutions are non-generic. So unfortunately for the vacuum equations without symmetry assumptions, um, the state of the art of mathematical analysis for nonlinear hyperbolic PDE of this type is that we can only hope to prove things in a neighborhood of very specific explicit solutions. So we're very, very far from being able to understand truly, you know, open and dense subsets of, 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 of the modular space. Okay. So, um, and somehow the reason for this, if you want, is that the, the only way that we know currently to prove or to try to prove formulations of this conjecture um, 
is uh, deducing sort of a proof of that statement of weak cosmic censorship as a corollary of a much more detailed theorem which completely describes the asymptotic stability of these explicit solutions in question. So to give you a very concrete example, uh, we can say that weak cosmic censorship indeed holds in a neighborhood of Minkowski space. What I mean is that you know, the generic solution in a neighborhood of Minkowski space does have the, the, the property that uh, future null infinity is complete. The only way we can deduce that statement is as a corollary from the, the nonlinear stability of Minkowski space, okay? which is a much more uh, precise uh, description of the asymptotic behavior of all solutions which emerge from data, which is suitably close to Minkowski space. So that's a famous theorem of Christodoulou and Kleiner. Um, so, uh, so the next window of moduli space to test weak cosmic censorship is uh, in a neighborhood of, of the black hole solution. So remember the, the, the Schwarzschild and Kerr black hole solution satisfied the predicate of weak cosmic censorship. So sort of the next window to look at is, is there. Um, and indeed, if you want, the, the mathematics necessary to prove the the nonlinear stability of black holes without symmetry was developed over the past 20 years based on previous work in the physics literature with contributions from, from many authors. Uh, maybe I'll say very, very uh, briefly the sort of main steps um, in uh, understanding this problem. So, um, so in reality, although this is the nonlinear stability of black holes, it is primarily a linear problem. And most of the difficulty was in solving the linear problem. So the first step to solving the linear problem was understanding completely uh, the wave equation on Kerr black hole space times. Uh, so the first work on this problem goes back to the first sort of mathematical work on this problem goes back to a paper of K and Walt. And there was a seminal contribution of Whiting showing mode stability of the Kerr metric. Um, and, and then as far as the um, scalar wave equation on Kerr was um, concerned, then in some sense, the, the, the final result um, is uh, some joint work with uh, Igor Rodnyansky and Jakob Schlappenthal Rothman from uh, several years ago now, where one showed definitive decay uh, statements for, for the scalar wave equation on such a uh, fixed background. So you can think of the scalar wave equation as a poor man's linearization of the Einstein equation. So the next thing was to understand the actual linearized Einstein equations um, on black hole backgrounds. So in some sense, step two, still talking about linear theory, was to understand linear stability of, of Schwarzschild. So again, this is a classical problem um, with many contributions over the years, starting from a paper of uh, actually my academic grandfather, Johnny Wheeler, uh, together with, with uh, Reggie. Uh, from the late 50s, and there were important work of Tukolsky and, and Chandra Sekhar. And using some of the insights of, of those papers and some other techniques, um, a few years ago now with, um, with Gustav Holzegel and Igor Rodnyansky, we showed the complete uh, linear stability of Schwarzschild. And this, uh, for the experts, this concerns both gauge invariant theory, but also gauge dependent variables in a teleologically normalized double null gauge. And this is very important uh, with the nonlinear application in mind because somehow in, in order to prove nonlinear stability, you have to have proved linear stability in a suitable gauge that allows you to formulate also the nonlinear form. And there was subsequent work of many uh, other people, uh, in particular Johnson, who reproved this in, in harmonic gauge and, and various other people as, as well. Um, and then this, uh, this result was quickly generalized to very slowly rotating uh, Kerr. In fact, you don't really need um, any new idea to do that. Um, you can essentially just perturb the proof. And so this was done independently by uh, myself and Holzegel and Rudnyansky, and uh, also by um, uh, Si Yuan Ma. Um, and then there were subsequent works uh, which sort of showed complete uh, linear stability uh, in various gauges in this very slowly rotating Kerr case by Anderson, Bechtel, Blue, Ma, and Hefner, Hintz, uh, Bass. Um, and finally, and maybe most interestingly, um, um, 
the full subextremal uh, case of Kerr was treated. And what you should have in mind is that the very slowly rotating case is just like Schwarzschild. There's really no difference. This full subextremal case, that's, that's where actual Kerr behavior begins. And it's, it's, it's much more complicated, but nonetheless, there are definitive boundaries and decay results for the Tchaikovsky equation on Kerr by Schlapetov Rothman and Teixeira da Korsta. And with this, you can then sort of show complete linear stability results uh, for the gauge um, dependent variables also, for instance, in, in double null gauge or your favorite well closed gauge. Okay, so that's sort of the linear situation. Uh, what about uh, nonlinear uh, stability? Well, the, the short story is that given linear stability, you can indeed with current technology prove nonlinear stability, but it's rather technical. So, um, so complete self-contained proof of the nonlinear stability of Schwarzschild without symmetry was given in a uh, recent work of myself with Holzigel, Rodniansky, and, and Martin Taylor um, from um, a year and a half ago. Um, so let me just make a very, very quick comment on, on the statement. Uh, so what does uh, nonlinear stability of Schwarzschild mean? Remember, uh, the Schwarzschild family sits as a, as a sort of subfamily of, of the Kerr family. Uh, and in general, if you perturb Schwarzschild initial data, you, you may end up uh, asymptotically uh, at a Kerr solution. So, uh, so when discussing the asymptotic stability of Schwarzschild, you're looking for the um, subset of moduli space uh, of um, finite co-dimension that does not do that, that sort of you're looking for the subset of moduli space of finite co-dimension that does indeed uh, asymptote to Schwarzschild. And, um, and sort of from the linear theory, you can see very easily that the expected co-dimension is three. So this is the theorem that indeed there, there exists such a um, uh, co-dimension three submanifold of, of moduli space passing through the, the Schwarzschild initial data set such that if you're on that uh, submanifold, uh, you will asymptotically uh, converge uh, to Schwarzschild. Um, and if you're on that submanifold, moreover, uh, we prove uh, specifically that you possess a complete future null infinity. Okay. So, uh, so if you want, um, this is sort of uh, was a first statement about uh, weak cosmic censorship in in without symmetry in a in a neighborhood of a non-trivial solution. Um, and I should also add that our, our theorem also tells you that the, the future boundary of the so-called um, domain of other communications uh, is indeed a, 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 a future affine complete event horizon. Now, again, for the experts, I, I, I maybe want to mention something about the regularity of event horizons. So um, one might think uh, naively that if your initial data is smooth, your event horizon should be smooth. And the smooth, I mean, you know, C infinity. Initial data C infinity, event horizon should be C infinity. But that's not actually the case. So the, the regularity of the um, event horizon depends on the weighted regularity of the initial data. So it's not enough that the initial data be, be, be smooth, but it has to be smooth in a weighted sense. And physically, it's actually not so natural to require that much sort of weighted regularity of, of, of initial data. So in general, the, the regularity of the event horizon is, is only finite. So sort of the, the natural regularity to consider will only be, be finite for that reason. Okay. So, uh, so this is the uh, nonlinear uh, stability of, of, of Schwarzschild. Uh, let me say very, very briefly that this was preceded by various um, results under symmetry, uh, starting from the work of Christodoulou. Um, I also wrote uh, some papers on, on this uh, back in the early 2000s. And uh, Gustav Holzegel in, in his uh, thesis uh, proved for the first time uh, sort of stability for um, vacuum uh, Einstein equations under a symmetry that reduced to a one plus one dimensional system but in higher dimensions, because as I already mentioned to you in a three plus one dimension, there's no non-trivial symmetry that you can um, impose that reduces you to a one plus one dimensional problem. Um, 
More recently, Kleinerman and Shafto, uh, proved a result in polarized axis symmetry. That's a, that's a two plus one dimensional reduction. And that, that work sort of also had to use the, the non-trivial linear theory that I talked about uh, earlier. Okay. Um, and I should also mention there's a recent extension of these results to the very slowly rotating uh, Kerr case by uh, a number of authors in interconnected uh, papers. And there's also work of uh, uh, Elena Georgi on stability of Reiser Nordstrom under the Einstein Maxwell system. And um, uh, well, in case I don't get to the last part of my talk, which I probably won't, uh, maybe I should mention at this point the very important work of Hinson Vasi from um, 2016, where they considered the analog of this problem for positive cosmological constant. Okay, which has various differences, but is also related. Okay. All right. So, um, so finally, uh, it's important to extend the Schwarzschild result to the full subextremal range of Kerr, the true Kerr solutions. And the road is open to doing this in view of the linear theory of Schlappenthal, Rothman, uh, Teixeira, and Acosta. Um, there aren't really any major conceptual issues in going from, from Schwarzschild to the full subextremal range of Kerr, given the the linear theory of um, Schapentoch Rothman to share at Dakosh. So that's really the deep part, uh, but it's a formidable engineering challenge to write a complete self-contained readable and hopefully short proof that survives the test of time. So there's a lot of work in progress and there are various people trying to write up such things. The real interesting case, especially from the point of view of weak cosmic sensation, however, is uh, the extremal case. So the extremal case, is uh, subject to the so-called arithmetic instability. So this was something that was maybe uh, discovered uh, almost 10 years ago now uh, by Arithaitis. Um, so this is a, a funny, unexpected instability on the event horizons of extremal black holes. And it's very general. So all extremal black holes essentially are subject to this instability. Um, nonetheless, there is a sense in which this instability is mild. So one could still hope that uh, one can still show some sort of nonlinear stability, which also at the same time accounts for the uh, arithmetic instability. And um, because sort of when you're looking at extremal black holes, the, the correct um, sort of formulation of the result is a, is a sort of a result in finite co-dimension, uh, we hope that the setup of our, of our work proving the nonlinear stability of Schwarzschild um, will be useful in, in attacking this problem. So we've made a specific conjecture uh, in, in our work, and there's also um, related uh, sort of work in the direction of this by uh, Teixeira, Dacosta, and Angelopoulos, and Thakis, and, and, and Gai. Um, so one could hope that uh, you have this sort of weaker form of uh, stability in, in this case that accounts for this sort of, uh, for an asymptotic instability on, on you know, in the spirit of this linear arithmetic instability, but uh, alternatively, uh, it could be that nonlinear dynamics near extremal black holes uh, may provide a window into new naked singularities. That's to say, it may be that when you perturb extremal curve, you actually find naked singularities, uh, possibly even stable naked singularities. So. This sort of window around extremal black holes, I think, is, is a very important arena for non-trivial tests of, of weak cosmic sensory. So I really think that this sort of understanding this window of moduli space is probably our best bet in, you know, if we're looking for violations of, or at, at maybe at the very least more intuition about uh, cosmic censorship, weak cosmic censorship, this is really the place, the place to look. Okay. So so much for the outside story. So maybe now I'll talk about the, the inside story of black holes and its connection to strong cosmic censorship and try to sort of uh, tell you the status of this problem. Okay, so, so on the one hand here, we have a, there, there is a sort of definitive statement that, that, that one can make. Um, and this is a, a theorem from a few years back uh, together with Jonathan Luke. And the statement uh, is simply the following. So. Uh, if, if Kerr is indeed stable in, in the black hole exterior in the nonlinear sense, um, then uh, our statement is that it's Penrose diagram is globally stable. So the Penrose diagram looks like this, okay? Just like in, in Kerr. And the metric extends 
at least continuously across a Cauchy horizon, just like the, the curse solution. So if, if, if you start with initial data, which is suitably near Kerr, two-ended Kerr, okay, and you have stability in the exterior, in the expected sense, then the statement is that the whole Penrose diagram is stable in the sense that the future boundary of the Penrose diagram is again null. And you can again extend the space time beyond, not necessarily see infinity, <laughs> we'll come back to that, but C0 continues. So, uh, so of course the corollary is that given the nonlinear stability of Kerr exterior, then the C0 formulation of strong cosmic censorship and the space-like singularity conjecture are both false. And uh, remember uh, to, to falsify a version of um, strong cosmic censorship, it's sufficient to have a whole, you know, to have one open set in moduli space where the predicate of the conjecture does not hold. Okay. So to prove weak cosmic censorship or strong cosmic censorship, you, you need in the affirmative, you need to understand, you know, a whole open and dense subset of moduli space. But to disprove a version, you just need an open set of moduli space for which the predicate is. Open. So um Okay, um, so let me just say a, a few words about this result. So uh, you, you can think of this result, even though it, it sort of nominally is about the sort of singularity or the lack of singularity inside the black hole. Um, in, in, in reality, this is also a nonlinear stability theorem for the Einstein vacuum equations without symmetry, but it's a sort of a, a coarse grained, and I apologize for the spelling error. Uh, Um, so it's a coarse-grained nonlinear stability uh, theorem uh, without symmetry, and what what's interesting is that it can be proven despite the expectation that there is a severe instability associated with this Cauchy horizon. More on that in just a second, and and in fact, without actually understanding whether or not this instability occurs, so it's really sort of a, a, a low regularity in some sense, stability result. Okay, so, um, so what is this instability? Um, so this instability is nothing uh, other than the famous blue shift instability. So this first uh, was identified by, by, by Roger Penrose. And well, the sort of uh, story is well known to, to many people in the audience. So this is the, very quickly, this is the, Kerr geometry, so this is future null, future null infinity. This is the event horizon. This is the Cauchy horizon. And now you can you can imagine um, two observers. So observer one staying outside of the black hole, and observer two entering the black hole and going straight for the Cauchy horizon. So if observer one uh, sends a signal to observer two at constant frequency, so remember the the length of this curve is infinite, okay? So then uh, as these signals are received by observer two, the frequency of the signal, um, so the signal will become more and more uh, frequent. So it, it will be shifted infinitely to, to the blue uh, in uh, the electromagnetic spectrum uh, for no other reason than the fact that this total length is finite, whereas this total length is, is, is infinite. So naively, um, sort of, you can, if you think that, well, this, uh, these are sort of signals, you can think of this as a geometric optics type approximation to the Einstein vacuum equations themselves. So you might think that this sort of shift, infinite shift to, to, to the blue uh, at the level of the Einstein equations corresponds to some instability. And maybe that instability uh, actually, because the Einstein equations are, 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 are nonlinear, it actually destroys the Cauchy horizon before it gets a chance to form. Okay, so this was exactly the original uh, expectation um, of Penrose. Okay, so so this is uh, this is the blue shift instability. But immediately, uh, you you can see that there's a there's sort of a, a little caveat uh, to this whole story, uh, which is the following. You see, when when describing the uh, blue shift instability in this naive way, I'm imagining this observer here, and this observer is sending 
a fixed sort of signal, a fixed strength, you know, every second as, as, as according to this observer's watch. But if you think about perturbations of the Einstein vacuum equations, sort of outside of black holes, then perturbations actually want to decay. They don't remain constant, okay? And well, this, this sort of goes, goes back to um, a sort of early heuristic works of, of Price that have now been put on a completely rigorous setting by Angelopoulos, Aritaitis, and, and Gaich, which say that, you know, solutions of, of linear wave equations, at least, they decay inverse polynomially, uh, sort of along in particular such time-like curves like the one that, that, that I discussed. And that statement is sharp. So it's not only an upper bound for decay, it's, it's also a, a lower bound for decay. So, so the question is uh, whether this lower bound for decay that you have is enough to show that this, this blue shift mechanism can actually operate. So, um, so at the linear level, what, what happens is that this, this um, blue shift mechanism indeed wins over the decay in the exterior and the local energy at the Cauchy horizon blows up. So if, if I look at the hypersurface that pierces the Cauchy horizon, then the, the local energy here of a solution to the wave equation will generically blow up. Okay. Now remember for a linear equation, that's the worst thing that can happen, namely that, that you, know, you have blow up at the boundary. Okay. You could never have sort of the blow up at some point here. Okay. But again, you might, you might have thought sort of naively that because the equations are nonlinear in the full nonlinear theory, you, you actually have blow up. Okay. So, um, so this instability type result goes back um, in the physics literature to work of uh, McNamara, who's a student of, of Penrose, and again, has been put in the, under a complete rigorous um, uh, setting by uh, Jonathan Luke and, and, and Jens Bursk. Um, however, at the same time, in linear theory, the, the blue shift is not strong enough to cause amplitude block. So what I mean is that, to go back to this picture, okay, whereas if you look at a hypersurface that pierces the Cauchy horizon, the local energy of the solution blows up. So remember, this is at the level of H1 log of phi, phi is the solution of the wave equation, okay? Phi itself in amplitude remains bounded. And in fact, it's continuous. And again, uh, the first result of this nature goes back to McNamara and here's even the, the first time this, this, this statement here appeared in print in, in his old paper and has been proven uh, rigorously sort of for general solutions of, of the wave equation on Kerr backgrounds arising from compact support initial data by Anne France. So, so if you want, the story uh, for the wave equation is that you have exterior dispersive effects, namely polynomial decay of C. You have a blue shift effect associated with the Cauchy horizon, which uh, means that sort of suitable derivatives in suitable coordinates, I don't want to explain, uh, grows exponentially. And this, this blue shift effect is sufficient to severely destroy the derivatives of phi in, in local coordinates. So in particular, it, it means that phi will not be locally um, H1, but it is not strong enough to destroy the, the, the amplitude of, of C. Okay. So now let's make a naive uh, extrapolation. So if you think of this as a poor man's model for the Einstein vacuum equations, maybe in, in harmonic coordinates, for instance, then you should think that C is sort of like the metric G, okay? And derivatives of C are sort of like Christoffel symbols. So if you naively extrapolated linear theory to the nonlinear theory, this would suggest that the metric G can remain bounded, in fact, continuous up to here, but the Christoffel symbols will fail to be generically at least locally square integral. So our theorem with uh, Jonathan Luke essentially says that this, this extrapolation concerning the uh, metric is correct, okay? So you can extrapolate the stability aspect of this problem from the linear wave equation, which you can think of a very naive linearization to the full nonlinear equations. 
And moreover, you can do this without actually understanding what happens to the Christophel symbols. Okay, so let me end with some uh, open questions uh, that uh, these results um, uh, leave us with. So the first thing is, is sort of an obvious open question, namely, uh, do this extrapolation uh, also to the instability aspect. So show that uh, if you look at uh, generic two-ended uh, initial data in the neighborhood of Kerr, okay? So we know from the result that I said that the, um, well, given sort of suitable uh, stability results in the exterior, then the whole Penrose diagram is stable. And we know that the, the solution is extendable C0 beyond this um, null boundary, uh, show that generically it is inextendable uh, in H1 log. Okay. And uh, this audience knows, of course, uh, much better than I do that, well, okay, so there, there are two difficulties in this problem. One is analytic, is sort of, okay, show in suitable coordinates similar blow up results that you have for the linear for the pure linear theory. Okay, so extrapolate that somehow to the, to the nonlinear theory. So that's the analytic difficulty. But we all know that showing inextendability results in Lorentzian geometry is difficult, okay? And in general, I don't know of any inextendability results in this, in this class, specifically in this class. But I hope that I've, I've argued that this class is very natural from the PDE point of view, and so, you know, this statement would tell us that the, the Christodoulou formulation of strong cosmic censorship is true, restricted to a neighborhood of the uh, curve okay. And there's a lot of work under symmetry that unfortunately I don't have time to talk about, due to Israel Poisson, Ori, some old work of myself, Luke O, and recent work of Van de Mort. Okay. So very quickly, uh, another open question. Uh, so uh, we've identified uh, an open set in, in, in the moduli space, such that the whole singular boundary is null. And actually our, our theorem is a little bit stronger. It tells us that any spacetime that settles down to Kerr, and it's expected that the generic vacuum spacetime will either disperse or settle down to finally many Kerr solutions. Uh, so any such spacetime will have a piece of its boundary null. So this is also in some sense a corollary of our theorem. So that, that leaves it completely unknown. Is there any part of the spacetime boundary, which is space-like for some open in moduli space set of vacuum 4D space times? So it's a little bit ironic. It used to be thought that generically space, uh, spacetime singularities are null. So in view of these results, we know that there exist open sets in moduli space for which the entire uh, boundary is null. We are yet to see any open set in moduli space for which even part of the space time boundary is space. -like. So that's a, a very important open question um, to, to resolve. Um, there's also the question of the, the case of asymptotically Schwarzschild and extremal. Let me skip that. Um, and let me just end with this open question. So in uh, two-ended uh, uh, um, gravitational collapse, I've showed you open sets of moduli space for which the entire boundary of spacetime is null. Uh, what about one-ended gravitational collapse? Um, can that also happen? That's to say in one-ended uh, gravitational collapse, can it be the case that the entire boundary of spacetime is null? Can, can it be the case that there's a Cauchy horizon like this that closes off the spacetime? Or can you somehow exclude this? Is there necessarily a piece of space-like boundary? Because if you believed in this statement, then this would be a particular place to look for open sets in moduli space with part of the boundary space. So, uh, so I just wanted to say that uh, there's a recent advance on this question, but restricted to, to, to symmetry. So there's a spherically symmetric model, Einstein Maxwell scalar field model, for which you can actually study this. Um, and um, in a recent very nice work of, of Van de Mortel, uh, he's able to show that in, in his model, you can exclude uh, this behavior. Um, so uh, let me just end with this. Um, so I, I, I started with this picture 
uh, on my title page, and this is really an iconic picture of, of, of gravitational collapse. Um, but uh, you know, there's <laughs> there's still, as as I hope to sh to explain, a lot that we don't understand about uh, sort of singularities in particular. Um, we we don't know at all if there are ever open sets in moduli space where part of the singularity is space-like. But one thing that we do know is that the structure of spacetime around this point does not look like what's depicted here, that necessarily there will be at least a null piece of the singular boundary. So, um, so it's about time to finally re retire this, um, uh, this iconic picture. Um, and maybe make some progress on, on some of the open problems that I mentioned. All right, sorry to go uh, two minutes over. Uh, let me end there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.